In this video, we're going to take a look at standard G-CO.11. It talks about proving theorems about parallelograms. Theorems about par parallelograms are opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent, opposite angles of a parallelogram are congruent, diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other, and if the diagonals of a parallelogram are congruent, then the parallelogram is a rectangle. So for question number one, they've drawn a parallelogram and they said if ON equals 8X minus 6. So let's start by labeling what they're telling us. So ON is 8X minus 6. LM is 7X plus 9. NM is X minus 9. And OL is 3Y minus 7. And it says find the values of X and Y for which LM and O must be a parallelogram. And the diagram is not drawn to scale. All right, so we know, based on our theorems about parallelograms, that opposite sides are congruent. So OM would be congruent to LM. And then we also know that OL will be congruent to NM. So we want to start with the pair of sides that has the same variable. So we want to start with ON is congruent to LM because they both have X. And therefore, we could solve for X. And then we're going to be able to plug it back in this side, NM. And then we can figure out what Y will be because we'll know the length of NM. So let's get started by setting 8X minus 6 equals 7X plus 9 and solve for X. So let's move the one with the smaller coefficient first. So let's subtract 7X and we get X minus 6 is equal to 9. Then we can add 6 to both sides. So we get X equals 15. So then we want to take that 15 and plug it back in over here, or excuse me, not that spot. We want to plug it back in right here into NM. So 15 is our X value. Minus 9 will leave us with 6. So therefore, NM is equal to 6, and that helps because now we can set those two sides equal. So 3Y minus 7 is going to equal 6. So I'm going to write it over here. 3Y minus 7 is equal to 6. So we just want to add the 7 to both sides and get 3y equals 13. And then divide both sides by 3. So we get y equals 13 thirds. And based on our answer choices, they left it as a fraction. They did not get a decimal. So we'll look over here and make sure we are careful to pick out the right combination because they look a lot alike. So you just want to be careful. So x equals 15. So I see I got x equals 15 for b and d, but not a and c. So let's mark those out. And then y equals 13 thirds. So you just want to be careful not to choose D and make sure to get B, which has the right combination of X and Y. All right, let's look at another question. This one is a proof question. It says, given that ABCD is a parallelogram, a student wrote the proof below to show that a pair of, op of its opposite angles are congruent. And so it says, ABCD is a parallelogram is given. So that's true and given. Then BC is congruent to AD, and AB is congruent to DC. And they know that that is true because opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. So let's label what they've said so we can follow with their thought process. So BC is congruent to AD. So let's put some tick marks there. And AB is congruent to DC. When you're reading a proof question, you want to read through it and try to label everything they state so you can follow with that, that thought process and figure out what the next step would be in that process. So then they said AC is congruent to CA, which is itself. So that is the reflexive property when we state something is congruent to itself. And then we can finally state that triangle, let me get my highlighter, triangle ABC is now congruent to triangle CDA based on side, side, side. And then they've said that angle B is congruent to angle D. So we can always say that parts of congruent triangles are congruent. There's always three pairs of sides and three angles that are congruent after you've stated that two triangles are congruent. So a good reason why we know that those angles are congruent is because of corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And then a lot of times you'll see it written as just the an acronym, CPCTC. Okay, so that's it for number two. Let's look at number three. 
It says in parallelogram D, E, F, G, D, H is X plus one. So let's put that in the figure. H, F is four Y, G, H is three X minus three. And I'm actually gonna write that in a different color since that's on a different diagonal. And then H, E is five Y plus one. And it says find the values of X and Y. The diagram is not drawn to scale. So what we know about parallelograms is their diagonals are bisected. And so therefore, we know that DH would be congruent to HF. And we also know that GH will be congruent to EH. So let's just write out what would be congruent. So X plus 1 would be congruent to 4Y. And we know that... 3x minus 3, not plus 3. 3x minus 3 would equal 5y plus 1. And so both of those equations have x and y. So we can't solve for a variable when we have two of them. So we've got to figure out a way to get just one variable in an equation. So something we can do in math is solve for a variable and then plug it into the other equation. It's called a system of equations. So all I'm going to do is take the one that looks easiest. So the first equation looks easiest to get x by itself quickly because I can just subtract 1. So then I get x would be equal to 4y minus 1. And now I can put x in terms of y. So right here I'm going to plug that in. And it's going to give me 3 times 4y minus 1 instead of x. I can plug it in because I know that's equal equals 5y plus 1. And now I can solve for y because this whole equation just has y. So now I'm able to figure out what y is, and then I'll be able to go back and get what x is in a minute. <clears throat> so let's distribute the 3. We get 12y minus 3 minus 3 equals 5y plus 1. So let's put the minus 3 and the minus 3 together. We're just combining them to be negative 6. And that's still equal to 5y plus 1. Then we can subtract 5y, and we get 7y minus 6 equals 1. We can add 6 to both sides, so we get 7y equals 7. And then we can divide by 7 to get y equals 1. Now that we've got y equals 1, you can look over here and see that the only answer is B that has Y equals 1, but we don't want to just choose B. Let's go back and plug in the Y to figure out the X now. So we figured out in the very beginning of the problem that X equals 4Y minus 1. So now we can say X equals 4, Y is equal to 1, and then minus 1. So 4 minus 1 would be X is equal to 3. So then we can verify that B is the right answer because it has x equals 3 and y equals 1. All right, let's look at one more question. Question 4 says, in rhombus M, N, P, Q, the diagonals intersect at G. So let's go ahead and draw a rhombus. It looks kind of like a square that's leaning over, is what I always say. So then label M, N, P, Q going around the figure. Whenever you draw a figure, you want to start in any corner and then label it going around the figure. So it doesn't matter which direction you go around, but don't zigzag. <clears throat> and then it says the diagonals intersect at point G. So let's draw that in here. They said the length of segment MN is 16. So let's put that. And the length of segment NG is 10. And they want to know what is the approximate length of MP? So I'm going to highlight that with green. So they want to know, what is this whole diagonal MP going to be? So what we know about rhombuses, one of their properties, is that they have diagonals that are perpendicular to one another. So in the middle here, all of these angles in the middle are always 90 degrees. And that helps because that creates a right triangle with a hypotenuse of 16 and a leg of 10, and then we're able to figure out the mg, the length of mg. And once we know what that is, we can figure out the whole diagonal because we can just double it. 
All right, so let's set up the Pythagorean theorem. So we can say that mg is a leg, so mg squared plus 10 squared equals 16 squared would help us figure it out. And then let's solve for mg. So mg squared would equal 16 squared minus 10 squared. And then mg would be 256 minus 100. And then mg squared would be 156. And then when you take the square root of 156, notice in the problem it said what is the approximate length of mp, and none of these are decimals. So we can round off our answer to mg because it was very close when you type it in your calculator to 12.5. So let's put a different little symbol right there because it's definitely not exactly 12.5. So mg is approximately 12.5, and therefore mp, which is that whole diagonal, would just be 2 times 12.5 approximately, which gives us 25. Okay, so that's it for that standard.